So uh, without further ado, I want to give, I'll do very quick intros and then let uh, the discussion start. But um, Eileen Donahoe is moderating. She's the executive director of the Global Digital Policy Incubator at Stanford University Center for Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. It's a mouthful. And the free school institute, my friends. And yeah. Um, and um, amongst many other things that Eileen has done, she served as the first US ambassador of the United mm -hmm. Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, which has many interesting stories about that. Mm -hmm. um, she's done many more, and is currently a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, ambassador McFall to my right is obviously also at Stanford University and is a professor of political science, um, appears on uh, national news quite often. And Including in one hour show. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Williams show. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize if I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> two things you can't get ready for in life, airplanes and live CDs. Yeah. <laughs> do, do, do you mind if we go behind you? And <laughs> you can plug us. Just while the name is a uh, computer engineer and internet activist and was one of the architects of the Arab Spring in 2011 and is currently a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. Shamath is uh, founder and CEO of Social Capital, um, whose mission it is to advance humanity by solving the world's largest problems. Um, and may or may not be helping with that right now. And um, prior to that, was a key executive at Facebook in charge of several things, including user growth. Um, we're super excited to have a rich discussion tonight. Thank you guys all for being here. Thank you. So I, I have to say one word about Jessica. Um, she and I met about a year ago. Um, right after the inauguration at a gathering by the organizers of the Women's March in San Francisco. And I think it was such a dark moment politically for everybody. And we were all looking for constructive applications of our energy. And she shared her idea about tech for campaigns and getting that up and running. She has had this amazing year of really getting it going. And this is a manifestation of that. Um, I happen to share with her that day this idea about starting the Global Digital Policy Incubator. I just talked to Mike about potentially doing it at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And so we have just completed our first year. Pure coincidence, that exact day, that afternoon, I spoke to Hillary Clinton on the telephone, and I pitched the idea of coming to do our launch event, and she did. And so she came in October, and we literally put our report out yesterday. So, you know, it's online at Global Digital Policy Theater, the port of our launch event. So, and Mike was part of that. Um, so, anyway, life goes on, um, <laughs> and there are constructive things to do, but I think we're here because um, there are some very serious problems that we all need to address as it relates to digital technology and its impact on democracy and the information ecosystem. Uh, we obviously have three very unique and forceful voices here to share their perspectives. Um, I thought, here's how we would organize it. I mean, the, the simple idea that I think everybody is struggling with is how do we capitalize, continue to capitalize on the upside benefit of technology for everything good in society while protecting against the downside risk? That's just the big challenge. Um, and also here in this group, people are interested particularly about the intersection between technology and politics. So I thought I would start with the dark side um, <laughs> and ask each of these guys um, <laughs> how they think about um, so I'm over. <laughs> the, the negative side of this equation. Then we'll turn to the upside and um, look for some more optimistic movements on the future. <laughs> so, so let's start with Chabot. Um You made some comments recently, as I understand at Stanford, yeah. um, that's gotten a lot of attention about the effect of social media. And your critique starts with this idea that social media is ripping society apart, specifically by confusing popularity and truth. 
um, and eroding the fabric of society. So just why don't you start by unpacking those sentiments and tell us what do you see as the inherent features of social media that are peculiarly deleterious for society? Um, maybe I'll just frame them in two contexts. I think there's a there's a tactical sort of reaction to what social media is, and um, specifically, tactically, I think what's wrong is that we have a fundamental business problem issue. And if you know how any of these things work, right, there's uh, the ability for all of us to get things cheaper, faster, and better to such a degree now where cheaper, faster, and better is defined as everything for free. <coughs> and in that equation, what you're left with is um, a really tough proposition for a for-profit company, which is, well, then how does one make money? And the only answer today is to go to a completely different third party and say, why don't you subsidize my ability to then provide this great service to this other cohort of people? And this cohort of people and you may not have anything in common, and there may be no commonality or no interest in commingling, but you're going to subsidize that. Now, that happens to be, you know, Procter & Gamble and Budweiser, but it also happens to be random faceless names and numbers and credit cards who can act on behalf of their own intentions. And what that allows all of us to do is to, you know, tweet incessantly, to upload photos, to basically get, you know, unlimited email. Um, and we take it all essentially for granted. And by doing so, what I think what's happened is we have not really unpacked um, what this is really doing to us over um, repetitive exposure. So that's sort of the, the, the tactical problem with what's happened is we just don't know how to not allow these companies to be unbelievably profitable in a way that also guarantees um, some measure of control and predictability in what we're all interacting with. And this stuff is so subtle that it's easy to just get um, somewhat lost. Then there's a much more macro thing, which I think is the even more important thing, which is what we said, mm -hmm. which is that social media in many ways is literally the canary in the coal mine for everything else that is technical which is to say that we have a 99% 1% problem. 99% of all of this stuff is absolutely incredible. It's really fantastic. You know, um, autonomous driving is going like, to completely eliminate drunk and driving deaths over time. That's an amazing thing. The 1% is the chips that drive it will also be used to refactor AI in a way where we could not just eliminate blue-collar jobs and white-collar jobs. Now that we all do. Well, we may not have the money to actually go and drink, which would then, you know, make the whole incentive of eliminating drunk driving go away. Right? The whole point is that social media is just uncovering a set of issues that now cascade across every single thing that we all do in Silicon Valley. So, you know, what I tried to do is frame it. I didn't do a particularly good job of it. The sound effects are pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> and they are what they are. But that's what it is. It's a tactical business model issue for social media, and then it's the canary in the coal mine for the rest of the technology. So let me just ask, um, you highlighted the business model presenting a lot of problems. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about how you think about the inherent features of the technology. You talked about repetitive exposure. A lot of people are talking about the addictive qualities or the uh, making teenagers depressed, that, that kind of thing. How does that relate to the business model problem? So is it profit motive that's inherently the problem and that all of this is supposed to be just platforms for good? So yeah, let, let, me, let me use maybe um, some numbers to, to make the point. Take any social media site whatsoever. What, what, what they do, or you know, take Google, um, or take any other site that basically makes money off of advertising. <coughs> what they do is directly and indirectly collect enough information that allows some third party um, to advertise something to you. And if you said that an ad to you, to Nadia, let's just say, cost a dollar because she's unknown. The minute that we said that she's an American, now that dollar goes up to like a dollar twenty-five. If we said actually it's a female in America, now that's a buck fifty. If it's a female in America between 18 and 34, that's now three dollars. Oh hold on a second. She also loves to game. Now that's eighteen dollars. Oh wait, she's also now targeted on this specific site during the following time limit. And all of a sudden now, that same person in that same ad is now costing 40 or 50 bucks. So you have to take a step back and ask yourself, if you're in the seat of generating revenue, right, you're the chief revenue officer of any one of these companies, how can you not look at yourself in the eye and to not meet these revenue objectives by doing everything you can to make sure she's targetable, not as a random person, 
but as an 18 to 34 year old female in the United States who likes skating on this site. That's the natural economic incentives. And that's what I mean by it's a business problem issue, which is you now allow such a hyper level of exposure to very specific kinds of companies, to very specific kinds of people. We don't know how susceptible they are or not to any of this. What we do know though, is that it is targetable. And on the other end, this person tends to be more known. So Nadia now becomes very well known, but the person on the other side is gray. Why? Because you want the $35 of these things. And so all you really need is a credit card. And go and try it today. You can go to any of these sites and just use your credit card. You can basically go and get to Nadia, an N of one audience. And it's not that it's wrong. I think we just have to take a step back and acknowledge that it's possible and then say, what do you want to do about it? Is there any realistic proposal on the table besides the advertising model? Um, no, I mean, I, mean I, I think there are certain companies that have flipped it on its ear. So for example, you know, Netflix could have decided to be ad supported. Mm -hmm. They don't. <clears throat> and what they still find is that they can generate enormous amounts of revenue and be an extremely valuable business by allowing consumers to directly pay. And the value proposition is that there's a pure connection. There's a high fidelity connection between the company mm -hmm. and the customer and what the customer is paying for is what the company gives you. And whenever you have economic relationships in capitalism where you only have these bi-party relationships, you tend to have much stronger fidelity, right? The signal is better, the churn is lower, the business models are more reliable, they're repeatable. Once you have these tripartite agreements, you always have these gray areas developed and they always come out in ways that are unpredictable. Because again, it's much easier to control variables amongst two people than three people. Um, and so, uh, it, it really just begs the question at some point, um, who is going to refactor how we think about ways to make money on the internet? And by the way, there are smaller examples too. There's some wonderful little companies. I'll give you an example of one, Patreon. Um, what do they do? They allow these long tail of like all kinds of artists to basically be self-sufficient, but they do it via modern forms of patronage, right? It used to be the case that like nobility used to support the, the artist class. Now it's on a site, you can go and support it, uh, a person that's making a certain kind of art or a certain kind of music, and with enough liquidity now, there's a high fidelity relationship, and now there aren't any third parties involved, and you can get with one. So yeah. the problem in doing that for now, companies that are so large, is you're basically ripping out your market. And I think that's just a very difficult thing to do. Yeah. So there, there are two other, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, okay? But I, I have my opinion. So I gotta get it. It's okay if I expert. Sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, the rules here. Um, there's two other things that are different about this particular market you're talking about if you think about it comparatively. One is that consumers are not organized. So uh, if you think about other products we know and other eras in time we know, uh, consumers got together and organized, and sometimes as voters, by the way, they did that, to say we want a different product and we want to protect our information or or like you, you did Facebook, my Facebook feed, I hate it. It's, it sucks, it totally sucks. Uh, some algorithm has decided that, that Tammy Wittes, if you know her, she's a good friend of mine, is the most important person I should read every day. That, that algorithm is not working for me, right? <laughs> uh, but I, as a consumer, you know, I'm not organized enough to, to tweak it. I, I've had my debates with the Facebook feed, and you do the same. But it's, uh, uh, compared to other products I think about, I don't have a lot of control over what I do with that. Uh, and almost certainly I don't have any control of the information that, well, that's a free product, so you're giving it that for free, but that's a bunch of, you know, that's a bullshit proposition. And, and if we were more organized as consumers, I think we would have more pressure on the products. And the other thing that goes with that with other products is regulation. Uh, political people, political, you know, call that, there's these old fashioned things called trade unions. I don't know if you're, you're too young to know what they were, but they used to be really important in, in capitalism. Uh, and then there was consumer protection organizations, and then there was regulation of other products. None of that, we're just on the beginning of that, I would say, for social media platform companies. And, and think about this, a, a friend of ours, I, actually, I don't know, maybe he's a friend of other people here, but uh, John Podesta, if you remember him. Uh, and I remember the day, because I was involved with that, when uh, he learned about what happened with his information, right? And in my tech world, and I, I know I'm speaking to, I think, a lot of tech people, everybody said, oh my God, you know, what horrible cyber hygiene. This is a phrase I hate about in the dominant cyber. <laughs> <laughs> you know, stinky, like, oh, he didn't, he didn't know that that was a phishing exercise. Oh my God, what a fool, what a fool. You, the consumer, are a fool. And I, and I want to 
flip that around and say, why Google? I think it was, it was Gmail, right? Why Google did you give him a product that would allow phishing in his product? That's, how, that's outrageous. By the way, Google is doing some, I, I, we are on the record, right? So maybe I can tell you know, what, what Jigsaw's doing. But, but the notion that somehow the burden is all on the consumer for faulty products, I think is wrong. You don't think that, you don't, when you get into your Tesla, you expect your airbag to work. You expect your, uh, your uh, seatbelt to work. And maybe if you're a crazy libertarian, like my father in Montana, he still doesn't wear the seatbelt, right? Because he grew up not wearing them, and he thinks that's an infringement upon his rights. <laughs> uh, that's okay. But, but everybody else expects those things to work. Why don't we expect that from these products? Yeah, I agree, but I think part of it as well is you're paying for the Tesla. And I think we just should acknowledge that they're not paying for these things. So you need ways so to pay no, no, but, but that's where that's where the whole business model that you suck yourself said. I'm giving information to Google uh, if I use that product. Uh, they're not paying me for it yet. Uh, and that 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 relationship I think needs to be changed. So that is not I think only gonna happen via the other part of what you said, which is regulation, which is like, you know, I look at GDPR and it's probably first and most interesting thing that some somebody other than the consumer slash business is doing about Correct. these things. Yeah. And the implications of GDPR, not just within Europe, I think, but writ large across the world, um, are probably quite important along the lines of what you're saying, which is, okay, if you guys aren't going to do it bilaterally, then we're going to impose a set of reasonable expectations. You know, the equivalent of the airbag should work for these sites that are now just so important. And I think the cascading effect of that could be really powerful if they've done well. So let me, I'll just say that you're both talking about big paradigm shifts for the public, both as it relates to security and understanding. We, we basically need society-wide re-education about how to <coughs> provide security to ourselves, to our data, to our devices, everything. Um, or better products and better loans. Well, don't put it all on. No, I, do, I don't put yeah. it all on consumers. I, I think it's it's you know it's everything from governments need a whole new understanding of what is cybersecurity. It's been dramatically transformed, especially now. It's information that has become the weapon, not just hacking. Uh, you know, even though the Podesta example is dot, doxing and you know hacking and doxing, but um, I, so I think we need a dramatic society-wide change and understanding, as well as this dramatic reconsideration of alternative business models. So those are big platforms. Um, let me bring Whale in here. I was going to go to Mike, but let, let's save that. I got, I got a whole other category for you. <laughs> um, more on the geopolitics of it. But um, Whale, you, you are somebody who... Based, you know, you're a technologist, renowned civil society activist, um, and someone who we presume has deep appreciation for the benefits of these digital platforms for civil society, for free expression, for political organizing, freedom of assembly and association. So, first question is Do you worry about the loss of the opportunity to utilize these technologies for civil society, especially in the face of, let's say, authoritarian governments that are you know, using our fear and our confusion to justify shutdowns and things like that. How do you think about how we should protect ourselves from uh, bogus justifications for shutting down access to technology? Well, I think that. I want to take actually a step back and think that I, um, when I was involved in 2011 um, uh, activism, I, I really thought that the internet is a liberating tool. Like I thought that was to be Yeah. Uh, I said like, I used well, to work at the White House at that time. We called him the Google guy because the president could never remember your name. Taxi driver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Google guy. That was a very important time. Uh, good for you. Uh, <laughs> so, so I think I I was I was uh, at the time actually uh, in 2010 I wrote a tweet like I think the 2011 elections in Egypt is never going to be like the 2005 and it was mainly because of what I've seen um, happening on on 
social media. Like there's, uh, um, I like to call ourselves the outsiders. Like we are people who do not belong to the system of governance <laughs> that, the, that is running the country. And, and the internet allowed all these outsiders to find out that there is a lot of them and we could actually connect and we could do things together. We could at least talk, talk about our issues together. And uh, the naive we thought at the time that, wow, this is, this is going to rebound. There is a new power structure that's happening here. This is liberating. This is going to bring down uh, 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 dictatorships and it's going to change the way we are going to communicate with each other. And uh, I would say uh, that was unrealistic optimism. And it was mainly uh, the problem basically was that the regime did not learn enough about how, uh, how these technologies work. And, they did not have enough interest in in, uh, uh, in penetrating them as, as much as we do. Eventually, I came to realize, actually, these are tools. They are just like any other tool. They will be used for propaganda as well as they will be used for organizing to spread the truth. Mm -hmm. um, but the sad realization uh, that I also came to is like, it's much, actually, it's much better and easier to use them for the propaganda uh, than to use them for spreading and organizing for the truth for one particular reason, people who are, who, who believe that they have some values that they are, uh, that holds them in, accountable to, uh, to what they're doing in their society are people who are gonna be stopped. I'm not gonna come up with a fake story about uh, uh, a dictator to spread it just to brainwash people. I will hold my uh, self-respect and not do that. Uh, but the economics of social media, whatever that Chamath was talking about, for example, it's much, uh, um, much easier to uh, for a fake story to go viral, and it's much cheaper to produce it. Um, and it's much more expensive to debunk a fake story and to then distribute it. Um, so the, there's a big flow of economics, and I, um, I actually worry less about, um, I mean, I still worry about governments uh, um, shutting down services. I worry much more because it's much more subtle than governments using these tools in the same way uh, activists and individuals are using them to spread propaganda. Russia is a, there's a, there are very good uh, uh, studies that have happened about how the Russian regime is using the internet to kind of like silence uh, opposition. In Egypt, we have had uh, uh, a lot of our share, like um, the regime, the, the people who represent the regime are running hashtags and they're promoting, they're basically using the exact same, but I feel like a, a, a like after I, I wrote a I wrote a, a book of like my accounts of what happened and I kind of like put in everything I, uh, I I did and I observed that other people are doing that work and then I gave it to the uh, to the minister of defense who happened to be the president now um, because everything had changed and the world had changed and you know now in retrospect I thought I'm such an idiot because I'm kind of like here you know here's the manual you know um, it's not like he needs me for the manual he'll probably have a lot of experts as well to help him but. Um, it's my naivety that made me think, uh, and I think that has a lot to do with one, uh, tech companies are um, uh, motivated to uh, create PR stories that are wonderful and great, like the, how Uber is creating entrepreneurs. Honestly, that's bullshit. Uh, Uber is not creating entrepreneurs. Uber is, is a business that's making money out of, uh, out of getting, you know, people drive for them and, uh, and creating, a, which is fine, it's, it's great. But the story about it creating, uh, changing the world and creating uh, entrepreneurs is, is bullshit. And that's, that's part of, in my view, the problem in, in, in the Valley that we, we kind of like started thinking, uh, uh, we're discounting all the threats. That's not happening now. It's the opposite that's taking place. So it's kind of a uh, late observation, but I, I feel like all this optimism about, about the, the future in tech is, uh, to me, like I, I'd rather watch Black Mirror. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I tried to start expressing that. Just about, you know, it was too real. By the way, to your earlier point, there's this thing that's been happening. I don't know if anybody's been following the emergence of deep fakes on YouTube. I mean, that is like the scariest thing you've ever seen. Just to catch everybody up, it's you know, Google has these fantastic tools for machine learning that they expose. And um, you can now go and take a video and splice out anybody's face and replace anybody else's face. And it is done so accurately that mm. you can't tell who appears in these videos. Mm. And so there are all kinds of random videos. And now you can just imagine the spectrum, right? Uh, political propaganda to frankly like to revenge porn and everything in the middle, right? Uh, and now how do you even refute it? Are you supposed to go and actually ask Google to be fingerprinting everything that runs on the Google Cloud? Is that what we're supposed to do? Are these algorithms supposed to stop getting better? Well, 
again, 99.9% .9 of the uses of these of these machine learning tools is to actually do wonderful, good things. Um, but it's this thing where like this, this long tail distribution of outcomes now is so profound that it's, I mean, and by the way, the funniest thing was, I only found out about it last week from the guy that works at the Times, a well-known recruiter, and I was just flabbergasted. I mean, and it's, you see it, and you cannot tell the difference that it's not your face. And you're just like, how, how, how are we, like, if you run that as an ad, like, how will anybody ever know? You know? All right, so, so that's the third leg of this massive challenge in society, <coughs> the, the business model security problem, and then this deep, even deeper challenge to truth and veracity. Before we completely skip over propaganda, I want to come back to Mike. Uh, just because, um, you know, you've had such personal, direct experience of being the target of propaganda by probably the most sophisticated propaganda entity in history. Um, and um, I, I want to sort of make sure in this conversation we not only talk about the challenge from technology itself and these inherent features that we're still trying to get our heads around, and actually take a look at the malign actors capitalizing on these technologies. So I guess what I would say is, um, how would you describe for us what is different today, 2016, 17, 18, when it comes to foreign propaganda, particularly Russian propaganda, information ops, because of these new micro-targeting and amplification tools that, have, that they're capitalizing on. How should we be thinking about the problem of propaganda differently today than you might have a decade ago when you were thinking about it? Well, uh, I'll just say a couple of anecdotal things, right? I, I'm not anything systematic. I mean, first of all, I would, so for those of you who don't know, I went to uh, Moscow in 2012 as ambassador right as uh, people like you were out on the streets uh, protesting using social media for uh, political change. And that's right when Putin came back as president. Uh, and Putin is a very paranoid guy about these kind of groups. Um, uh, throughout the Middle East, by the way, uh, I remember he, <clears throat> when we first had our first conversation about uh, Egypt with him, it, it wasn't a political issue. He's like, uh, all these societies need enlightened leaders, you know, parentheses, people like Putin, uh, <laughs> lead them forward, because uh, if not, then chaos will, will go. And he said that about Assad and Mubarak, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't a geopolitical thing. He just, he has a strong view about those things. Number two, uh, and it's important to understand about him for how he's responding now, he also has a, a very deep and sophisticated and wrong theory about deep states and especially the deep state in the united states so you know bush comes obama comes trump comes but there is this 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 underbelly that is out to get people like him uh, and he assigns them incredible amount of power uh in agency in the world in russia and elsewhere and so third as a result of that he has invested um, you know, large sums of money over the last 18 years since he's been there, especially in the last decade, into uh, a counteroffensive to what he sees as, as our deep state. Um, and uh, I experienced it very personally in a couple of ways, like fake news and, and, and uh, not the sophisticated stuff you're talking about. I have seen those before, and, but that's coming from them as well. But, you know, when I, uh, I remember the first time dealing with fake news, it was three weeks in as ambassador, where there was a video up that insinuated that I was a pedophile. Um, and, you know, uh, at first he said, well, how can anybody believe that? And my public relations officer, the guy said, well, we don't need to respond to that poor shit. You know, who cares? Of course that's not true. But then it kept going and it kept getting tweeted and it kept spinning around on YouTube and and then it's like well what do you do you get on TV and say no I'm not a pedophile uh, and then it's like well hold on why is it getting so defensive right um, and and that's the thing if you haven't been the target of it I think it's hard to understand the motivations here right so then we got YouTube to take it down by the way because I knew people at Google and uh, but yeah, yeah uh, not this guy somebody else 
Halo, Bu. Another one, it was, it was a more silly one, but it's about what's coming in the future. I was, um, my face was uh, photoshopped onto a Navalny t-shirt. Uh, this guy, he's an opposition figure in Russia, and it made it look like I was campaigning for Navalny. Um, and by the way, just with all the usual clickbait stuff, with a very uh, beautiful Russian woman standing next to me, you know, done in a very, by, by 2012 standards, pretty good. Today, you would laugh at how sloppy it is. But um, uh, it was the same thing. It was like, okay, come on. We used humor first. Like, uh, my hands aren't that big. If my hands were that big, I could play basketball better. Things like that. But the, the, it, it doesn't die. And then it kicks around, and people think, well, maybe McFall is supporting Navalny. And then they click on that, and, and it, it lingers. And that's what they're doing all the time with two additional things to remember. One is there's no constraint on the truth for what the Russian government does. But so we used to get frustrated by that. We, we are, had our hands tied in terms of this interaction. They didn't have their hands tied. They don't care about truth. Putin's goal is not to convince you, and this is how it's different from the commissar. He's not trying to convince you that he's right and the fall's wrong. He just wants to make you think that there's no truth. Uh, and if he can get to that point, he wins. Uh, and so by mixing it up, lying, cutting and pasting, and with this new technology coming on board, I think it's going to get more complicated. That's the game he wants to play. The other game, the other thing they're not constrained by is the profit level that you talked about. So the RT, one of their instruments, social media companies, uh, notice I called it social media company. I didn't call it a television company because soon there will be no television companies. Um, they're not constrained by a lot of uh, they get as much money as they need to do certain things. So how does how does this become pernicious over time? Like how how does this what's coming? Uh, and I know the woman that that founded uh, RT. Well, Margarita, I wouldn't say we're are we still Facebook friends. I think we're still Facebook friends, but not much more than that. Uh, but um, uh, how does it affect things? They give away what's called B-roll on television. Right? AP charges for it, Reuters charge for it. Uh, but, uh, and if you're, you know, NBC, like uh, where I need to go very shortly, you know, we have enough money to do B-roll right now. Maybe not, and thanks to Trump, we have more money for that than before. But we're struggling on that. We don't have foreign correspondents anymore. We have one, you know, it goes around the world as, a, as opposed to having bureaus. But if you're a smaller uh, media company, you have zero money for B-roll. So what you do, you can pay Reuters, or you can get it for free from RT. And let's say you're doing a show on Syria. Well, guess what your B-roll shows if you take it from RT? It shows a very different picture than what Reuters come, it shows. So because they're not constrained by profit, and I would say this about the Chinese too, if we have more time, uh, that over time is gonna play a, a bigger and bigger role, not just in what we can identify as like Russian TV or Russian propaganda, but, but in media as a whole. Uh, and then the final thing that aids them, uh, and you know, when, maybe if we get to policy things, I, I'd like to hear what you think about it. Uh, of course, the blending of news and opinion, which you know, we had that fight in journalistic world a long time ago. That's why there's an op-ed page, at least for some of those more <laughs> archaic uh, publications that I still get. Uh, but you know, there there is a sense, and there's. There's a commitment, a normative commitment, that there's a separation about that. Uh, Russia, of course, doesn't have that in any of their publications. You, you, there's, there, there was one op-ed page. It was a joint venture between Wall Street Journal and Bedmasty, and it was a great project, and, and, and the Putin folks sat down. So they want to blur all that stuff. But our social media platforms, of course, do that too. So that's great for them. Uh, you know, my feed does not separate out opinion and, and front page. Uh, you can do it, and, and maybe it should be done. My, my feed doesn't separate out bots from real people, right? My feeds. Uh, and that is a permissive condition 
for the kind of information campaign that they want to play. And that they, you know, they benefit from the fact that we don't do those kinds of things. So this gets to Wales' proposal, because you talk about the, the merging of, you, you highlighted news and opinion, but there's also ads, user-generated content, and news. And the collapsing of all those things into one feed has created all kinds of problems. So I want to highlight the proposal you put forth around transparency of data uh, from social media platforms. Um, basically, to make data about algorithmic content delivery and targeted advertising and content removal decisions publicly available through public interest APIs. So tell us a little bit about that proposal. Yeah, so, so, so just for a uh, for quick background and agreement with uh, uh, what Mike talked about in terms of the truth, um, and Chamath also like said, the mixing the truth and, and popularity, I think one thing, while, while the, the financial motivations of these companies played uh, an, an important role, but I think it was not just it. It was basically the, uh, the naivety of the, the people building these products. Naivety here is not a, in, in, a, in a bad term, but people were just basically figuring out what is this. Look at what, how Facebook defined itself when it first started and how it evolved over years. It's just like a baby that's growing and that's learning, uh, uh, learning about the world in different ways. No one saw the Facebook today when it started. So um, this naivety caused it. We had this uh, as technologists that decentralization is good. That basically, when you remove this uh, editor in New York Times out of the picture and replace him with an algorithm um, um, that is able to scale, because also the editor in, in New York Times is not going to be able to read uh, millions of pieces, um, you replace them with an algorithm, and that algorithm is purely based on engagement, which means um, hopefully uh, that content, if you like it, if you click on it, then you probably want more of it, uh, yes. uh, hence, hence whatever you are, uh, uh, what, what you're experiencing. And, and by the way, just to interrupt, those influences are also penetrating the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal as well. So, and, and the Washington Post. Yeah. So, so the last elections, uh, I, I also work at the Washington Post, uh, the last election was the first time where if you walk into the post office now, what, what articles are trending, you're, they're looking at in real time in a way in their old building that the editors controlled, and that led to a disproportionate coverage of Trump. So it, it's it's yeah. also affecting the, the old school stuff. Too. Yeah, it's like it's like it's like saying we 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 shape our tools, but then our tools end up shaping. Right. It's like yeah. the um, so so I think this notion of decentralization. There's there's one wise person I forgot their name that said um, in in tech companies uh, they they want to distribute uh, information that is engaging and hopefully truthful, uh, but in in respectful media publications they want to spread information that is truthful, but hopefully engaging. And, uh, and I think, um, because I talked a lot with ranking engineers from the early days, because we kind of saw like the negatives of how these algorithms are driving polarizations in Egypt. So I have uh, spent a lot of time with people at Facebook and Google um, at Twitter, because I, I do think those people actually want a better world. Like they're, they're not like, huh, let me make, you know, make a buck out of like, you, they, they generally, they don't understand what is going on. It's so big and it's so fast. Um, so I feel one one important aspect here is, and we gotta be uh, uh, we gotta be true to ourselves. If we, if we really think as tech, tech people that we want to change the world to a better place, um, and we have built these uh, uh, decentralization power horses that enable anyone to just basically spread information to millions of people using algorithms that are not even like paying paying attention to what is truthful or not, because it's very hard to know what is truthful or not. The, the, the least, the minimum uh, uh, we could do is to be more transparent. And the transparency here means, for example, um, all these Russia uh, propaganda campaigns that happened, which, by the way, I'm one of those people, I'm, I'm not 100% sure that it would change the outcome of the, like, maybe the WikiLeaks, yeah, but, but like, you know, the Russians creating a page, uh, uh, a, Black act, uh, uh, a Black Lives Matter activism page where, in which they spread information. I'm not sure if it, if it really changed the outcome of elections, but nevertheless, the fact that some external player could just suddenly get in, spread misinformation using these algorithms, um, one, without the, the platforms capturing them from the early on, two, without transparency to the society. Like I'd rather, as a member of the society, I'd rather want to know what are, uh, because every one of us is getting a personalized version of the feed. We don't really know what's common knowledge anymore. 
Uh, I don't know what you're seeing. I don't know what Shamat is seeing. I don't know what Ali is seeing. We just don't know what are we exposed to. There are different versions of reality. There need to be a macro view where it's saying, here is, here is all the information that got spread. Of course, anonymized. It does not uh, um, uh, expose or receiving the information. But if you decide to, to uh, uh, broadcast something in public um, and you agree to broadcast it to as many people as possible, there, the society should have the right to know to what extent whatever you pushed uh, is spread. And then uh, Mike could tell in his case, if there's a propaganda campaign against him and he finds 5 million people interacting with it, then he knows it's time to respond versus if it's just like uh, a thousand people. Um, so I'm not saying that this is the solution. It's not going to solve the problem, but this is the bare minimum. And, and to me, like if tech companies are not doing this today, I, I think Twitter has been doing an amazing job in terms of that um, and has been collaborating a lot with researchers and, uh, um, uh, is that right? Yeah. Or, uh, I'm just looking at your face. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I think Twitter, is, <laughs> uh, Twitter is, is like, compared to other social media companies that are much more open and they, they provide their fire cargoes access to people. And, you know, researchers could, could learn from that, but but Facebook and YouTube have a long all, way. All these things are you're just gonna swing the pendulum way back to centralization. I mean, like, mm -hmm. it, it, it is the case that today there are regulatory bodies that define things in an offline world. Now, in an offline world, there was a, a contextual frame of reference that said houses need to be built in such and such a way, electricity needed to operate in such and such a way, transformers needed to operate, you know. So there were all these rules, and these rules were defined by central authorities. And what's interesting is, is in our world, We've always divorced ourselves from this from this concept that that could ever apply to technology. But the reality is, what we do every day is we are actually just writing rules. We're just writing rules into a computer, and then those rules are getting executed. And so, at some point, there will be a logical leap, which is not that logical, which is to say, well, maybe there should be some centralization in how we define some of these rules. And you know, everybody will throw their hands in the air, and there'll be a bunch of hand wringing, and people will say, this is absolutely unacceptable. And you're going to see it, I think, in, for example much more obvious and highly regulated areas, but this will be, again, the tip of the iceberg. So I'll give you a perfect example. Today, we can run, you know, see it convolutional neural nets, like the image processing to identify tumors, okay? <clears throat> there are going to be cases where the number of false positives and the number of false negatives get to a degree, because we're just dealing with enough N, where some country, some government, some health system, somebody will say there should be some amount of regulation and understanding and transparency into how that classifier works. Why is this a tumor and why is that not a tumor? Because the implications of this, one is a double mastectomy and one is nothing. That's going to, and we'll all nod our heads and say that's reasonable. But then eventually just understand that that decision framework is no different than why this piece of content and why not that piece of content. And, and, and it will go there. And it will go there, in my opinion, because all of this data that will eventually be exposed and or curtailed and or cordoned off will start this conversation about, wow, maybe there should be some centralized. Now, again, that will make it crappy <laughs> and people will screw this up and it will not be great because, like, I mean, how many of us throw our hands in and say, we love regulation? I mean, you know, we love, the, we love how long it takes to get a building permit in Palo Alto. It's, nobody says that. Um, but those guardrails are there for a reason, and some version of those guardrails likely will exist. Now, the compounding problem with that is, it's one thing to say housing regulations in Delhi should be completely different than housing regulations in Palo Alto. It's another thing to, to say, India says, you know, uh, this ranking algorithm should work the following way, and America says this other thing, and then Belgium says another thing, and it's one company trying to do all things. So again, ultimately what it means is like, we are going to re-rate how we think about this idea of cheaper, faster, better. And in this weird way, while it has huge multiple compression and huge value destruction in the short term, it may actually be the only thing that sustains us in the long term, which is that we look like every other company, which is to say, crappy and bloated. <laughs> expensive to run, expensive to operate. You know, none of the things that we get are free. Teslas are not free, right? But it's okay. Because it comes with a set of expectations and it comes with a set of, you know, hygienic expectations that we value. Um, and so this just may be the great unwind of this, uh, this wonderful kind of like world we've lived in for the last 20 years where we've gotten everything for free. So I'm just going to say we're getting close to the end and we're going to go to questions. Um, I just want to make one comment because some of the work that uh, 
that's being done at Stanford is around innovation in rulemaking processes to match this challenge as well. So you, you talk about recentralization. I think a lot of people are talking about multi-stakeholder process innovation so that the rules, yes, we need rules, but they're not made in the same old, old school centralized way. So just commenting that there too we need innovation. Sure. Yeah. Um, let's, let's quickly quick, say something that you're optimistic about or <laughs> Optimism is overrated. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, idea, if you were to propose, a, you know, directionally some kind of reform as it relates to prop, dealing with propaganda, mm -hmm. a new business model, mm -hmm. you know, transparency, any of these themes, what would you put on the table? Or what are you yourselves working on? You know, to take your constructive energy and try to contribute to I this. I'll give you two things. One is at the highest level, which is... Um, I think that there is a new business model of truth. I think we're all figuring out what it means, but uh, that new business model is a trade-off where you have a relationship directly with your end customer. Um, and what happens is there's an economic bilateral agreement. You must break this tripartite agreement, this sort of three different organizations working in this weird ways. Yeah, I want it all. Yeah, I'm kind of not going to pay for it. Okay, you're going to give me something. Okay, I'm going to ignore you. But oh, wait, you have to break. We have to break ourselves from that. And so I think that there's a bunch of ways in which there's a business model around truth and truthfulness that will get explored over the next five or six years. And the, the tipping point will be the 2018 election. 100% it is going to be something we have never seen. Okay, so if deep fakes are happening today in 2018 now, once we really hit it, it's going to be unbelievable, okay? Now, what am I doing? Well, nothing related to that. Um, but what I fundamentally do believe is in this idea of decentralized power. And towards that, I think that there is an arms race happening uh, along some very specific threads around critical ingredient technologies that right now, if they are only held by the existing oligopolies, we are not in a great state. Um, things around machine learning and artificial intelligence, things around proprietary sets of data. If those things are only controlled by the mega monolithic organizations of the world, it is bad <coughs> for the world. And so the way that I think about how I take my money and put it into the world is, okay, how can I help create technologies that are so important? They are like the Achilles heel. They don't seem like anything to you guys, but how do you follow giant? You slice them at the Achilles heel, and you fall, right? Or how do you control a specific amount of data and information such that we will never, ever sell to a large company and then just make the problem worse? Um, and that's the way that I intend to do my part. Um, and so, you know, we're baking the next layer of silicon for machine learning. You know, we have all this incredible data around how people react and behave around things. Now, what we need to figure out is what is the truthfulness around it. And I never intend to sell these businesses. Ever. Now, I thank Facebook for giving me the ability to not have to do that. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we have so many questions there about open data, how that relates to your concept of centralization. But maybe we have to save that. Let's go, you guys. And uh, yeah, you I'm going to have to go, so yeah. I apologize. Um, well, one of the things I'm going to say on TV is, <laughs> practically, uh, what we need as a, as a democratic society is we need a, uh, an old-fashioned paper trail for yeah. all, all of us, period. That, the, there's the, the bigger, the, I, I have a list of 15 things that we should do in terms of protecting <laughs> our, our sovereignty. But there's no way in our current political context we can do any of those. That's a very practical thing, that there's only nine or ten states that don't do that, and that's what we should be focused on, period. If we were really ambitious, people that had anything to do with uh, the counting of the vote would have to do dual authentication. But that's really, really, that's way out there. That's not going to happen. And protection of voter rolls. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, if, you, if you're on a machine that, that has to do with voter rolls, you have to do something very simple. And, and here's the, the, the trade-off, my father versus the centralized authority that is called Stanford University. I can, I can choose whether to do that on Gmail or not, right? Stanford doesn't allow me to choose. You have to do it. 
That's their rules because they don't want. Uh, and, and you can imagine, I'm a high, <laughs> I'm a high, tar I'm a big target uh, kind of guy. Uh, I, I know Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear personally uh, in terms of what they do. Um, and so Stanford, because they're a private entity, just said, okay, you can't get on our system unless you do it. Why can't we do that for staffers in the U.S. Congress or people that have to count our vote? Seems pretty simple. To me. But okay, those are my two ideas. Um, so I actually was thinking about uh, uh, writing some idea about the Museum of Privacy, like 100 years from now, uh, I'll be able to look at you and know exactly what's in your mind without you speaking anything. So life will be very predictable. Um, and then there will be zero privacy and life will eventually suck, but that's how humans will advance their, uh, you know, how, how technology will, will advance and help humans become better people. Um, but then there will be a museum of privacy where you go there to learn about people, ancient people like us who happen to have uh, more exciting life and unpredictability because I don't really know what's in your mind. Uh, and I have to uh, ask you, okay, that, that was just a joke. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I'm outside of living now, they're still unpredictable. Yeah. <laughs> to some extent. Uh, I, think, I think the, I, I, I really agree with the notion of uh, re-centralization or rebalancing balancing power it's 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 for me it's not it's it's more about if, if a group or entity I, I would not trust anyone when people ask me what I'm allergic to I'm allergic to power um, not having it of course I like having power but uh, <laughs> but have with power in the hands of uh, like huge power in the hands of anyone because we are all uh, amazing creatures as, as soon as we have huge amount of power that's unaccountable we do horrible things and that goes for me and goes for many others um, it's um, I'm not speaking on your behalf. You are awesome. Um, so, so I think rebalancing power is a great question right now, and uh, investing in, in in ways where the com you know there are more you know there's more conflict of interest among different powerful people is very important. Like to me, that's democracy. I see democracy as a conflict of interest between um, kind of like equally empowered individuals and organizations. And once that goes away, you have a dictatorship, like back home in Egypt. Um, and you know the accountability and transparency is key for that. My, uh, I, I don't really claim that I'm, I'm doing anything that's uh, uh, that in that direction, other than like doing my share as an as an individual. Uh, I'm just at the end of the day one citizen in the world. I, I went visited the Congress, visited the EU, uh, uh, just told told them some some of the ideas. They have been thinking around it as well. I talk I talk to people at at the, uh, at the companies because I also believe that. You know, I know many people uh, um, look down to self-regulation and think it's, um, you know, I, I think we need, you need both. That's a good idea. Yeah, because, because I think, for example, like Facebook's biggest uh, 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 asset is the employees. I mean, now you could also say the data, but the, the one that they could actually lose tomorrow is like, that's why I, I think uh, uh, Mark and others like started to take the matter seriously because there's a large number of employees are really concerned. These people are going to work in the morning feeling that they're not doing the world a better, uh, they're not making the world a better place. Actually, they're making it much worse. Um, you know, it's kind of not fulfilling and they don't, they want to tell people I work, work for Facebook and everybody's excited and happy about them working for Facebook. So I think um, uh, um, part of what I'm really interested in is to talk to as many uh, people in, in these companies and, you know, get them to think. And I do believe that there is, uh, there is some dynamics, it's some mixture of civil society uh, uh, working, you know, pressuring these companies. I think uh, uh, I've been like thinking and talking to people about it's ridiculous that there are all these uh, advocacy groups against governments and none against these companies, which are probably far more powerful than, than governments. So having civil society target these companies uh, and in a constructive way. Um, and, and make them accountable to their actions is very important. Uh, media is uh, uh, raising the media awareness and then uh, creating a bottom line for them. Like, uh, you know, the oil company's uh, interest is to make profit, but eventually after, after many, many years, you started seeing more like bottom, like you cannot just dig in any place and, and get, uh, get the oil as, as you used to do in the, in the past. Of course, like during Trump era, it's different, but I'm, I'm talking about <laughs> Just two thoughts before I mean, I wish I could listen to this. I mean, when we're talking about power, remember another way to deal with too much power is competition. Um, I, I'm not an expert on these things, but, but, but as a consumer, I don't like the choices that I have on, in terms of media right now and in terms of platforms. 
Uh, and I, I've thought about that, like, um, you know, Facebook, you said we would, we'll, love, we'll look back fondly on these days. I actually think Facebook is not a great product right now. I can think of lots of ways that I, as a consumer, would improve it if I had the consumer power to do that. And right now, one doesn't. Same with Twitter. If I could pay, uh, I'd pay uh, several thousand dollars on Twitter, not, not no bots. That's, that, I would do that. And maybe there's another world that there are bots over there, then you can get it for free. And, and I don't quite understand why. I mean, we did that with spam, right? Remember, again, you may be too young, but there was a day when uh, you know, you used to get 80% of your time when I used to be spam. <laughs> Right. Yeah, this is also right. such an idea of, of truth as a business model or as your business yes. proposition. So, and so Jack Dorsey is talking about this, right? Trust and truth, and, and or, or just product experience. differentiation. I, I don't even care about truth. I, I, I <laughs> no, I mean I care about truth. But, 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 let me put it. Let me let me put it in a more metaphorical way. Like 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 I am a uh, you know what do I do as a professor at Stanford? I, I the main thing you do is you present, like, like a literally, I think it was in my office now, I'm literally doing it right now. I'm putting together a syllabus to teach a course in the spring. I'm making choices about what is valuable to read. And we have a process, it's flawed, but we have a process, and it's a market process too, by the way, uh, that somebody has decided that, that, that me, as a tenured professor at Stanford, they're gonna, they're gonna pay a lot of money to come listen to my lectures, uh, because they decided that, that that curation process of knowledge is something valuable. That happens every single day at Stanford. Why is that so impossible to do on Facebook? Why is that so well, impossible? I think, I think that's because of the narrative fallacy of startups. People love the whole, you know, I woke up, I went to a mountaintop, I smoked paleo, you just yeah. came to me. <laughs> and that's never true. That's why I said it's like you start with a starting point. It's embarrassing. But those of us who are willing to live with the embarrassment keep iterating, and then all of a sudden everybody thinks, you're better looking than you've always been. You're yeah. taller, you know, <laughs> you can sing better, dance better, jump better. I mean, I would make that analogy. It's like, and all of a sudden you fall for the narrative. Yeah, that's a good point. And so then it's like, well, why would we go and change things? You know, there's an elegant narrative that's on our website in the about page. You know, how, we can't change the about page. Um, and so it's really, it really boils down to this narrative fallacy, which is just, it's sad, but it's, it's part of the... If there's more competition, you might think about changing Absolutely, yeah, but it's right, also yeah, part right, of yeah. the growing up that we have to do in I got around. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. What's your call? Yeah, we can take a couple. Okay, we think we have to be done. Like five minutes. Sure. Great. Thank you. Okay. I have a two part question. The first is a yes no. Um, so, based on not some future state, but based on 2018, if there's, say, an article that spreads widely, it's obviously big, we have libel laws that obviously the publisher can be directly targeted. Yes or no, should any of the tech companies be held accountable that presented this content? And if so, who? Let's just say Facebook, Twitter, there's a social element of it, there's Cloudflare, there's others. So yes or no, if yes, who should be held accountable? Second, if you're the product manager for Facebook newsfeed today, arguably one of the most important people in our lives, mm -hmm. is the answer thumbs up or thumbs down, as they've suggested, asking people what, um, it's real and what's happening. Um, should the tech companies be held accountable? Not yet. No. I mean, I hate to. I, I mean, I think it would be an easier answer if you said yes, but I don't think so. I just think that we've not had the conversation of what matters. None of us have actually demonstrated that we actually want that. So what? What we're all like? We're all guessing, and we don't even know what's real and fake anymore. So who is to say that? This is what I'm saying, like, you will see deep fakes. You will not know the difference. So your version, so for example, let's take Trump's tape in that, you know, Access Hollywood bus, right? There's a version of that now that where he can just say, that's a deep fake. No, 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 you guys laugh. No, 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 that's no, no. true, yeah, that's true. Who are you to refute that now? Well, wait a minute, I have the video. No, that's a deep fake, that's from China. He couldn't, he wasn't able to say that going into the election. He can absolutely say that as a, February 13th, 2018, and you cannot refute it. So how can you hold the company accountable yet until we haven't had a conversation about what is acceptable and not acceptable? I think that's now unfair. And the reason is because, again, we have this weird disparate ecosystem of all these things happening all at the same time, very, very high velocity. 
So I just think it's it's an easy way to say that. It's also easy to say let's blame the product manager. It's not the problem. Um, we celebrate things that are simple and easy, okay? Societally, you know, we're not interested in things that are like hard to comprehend and take 15 minutes to read. We like 30 seconds, you know. We like reality television. We don't like things that are on PBS. I mean, we have created this world for ourselves as well, you know. We think success is this sort of like monoline definition of having a lot of money. It's not teaching grade two and like, you know, having a decent life on 80,000 bucks a year, two incomes. So we've done it to ourselves. And so until we start the great unwind of what is the definition of all of these things and reframe values, then you can start to hold people accountable because there's a shared set of expectations. Until then, I really do think like there's an expectation of, again, and this is where you see Europe saying, okay, you know what, stop. I'm not going to let you to think, you know what, guys, you guys all go get around in the muck and muck, or get around the muck. I'm just going to make a set of rules. And they're allowed to do that. And so that I think that right now is the only thing that can be expected, is for governments to take a point of view on behalf of their population. And then the cascading effects are, will be what they are. And by the way, it's going to happen. Do you think that's the, the, the proper approach in the sense that, because I'm trying to actually understand from this discussion what you mean by centralization of governance. Are you talking about individual governments actually centralizing the governance of their constituency or are you talking about pseudo No, uh, well, it, it'll depend. I mean, like the EU is whatever they are. Like India will have a totally different set of rules and expectations. Sure. I think, do you think that also goes towards authoritarian, that, that could breed authoritarian? So, so, so look, I mean, look, pendulums are these interesting things that move, you know, continually and temporally, okay? They're not here and then here and then here and then here. And so I think what, where we were was in a place that was highly centralized. And through largely capitalism and technology, the intersection of those two things, we've moved the world to a very decentralized place. And I, I fundamentally agree with you that now there is going to be a reversion to the mean. That mean reversion is going to be structurally... Um, Difficult, but I think it will be in the long run healthier for everybody. And when that happens, there's going to be two forms of centralization. One is a set of rules. We have rules that we live in, in the offline world. You should expect that there are online rules. You should expect that there will be transparency into how algorithms are written. You should expect that there will be people whose job it will be to inspect these things and publish. Here's how these things will happen. You should expect that. Because I think governments will have a responsibility to act. Then there's a centralization of ingredient technology and data. That today, in my definition, is happening in, a, in too small of a circle. And so this is where I love this idea of like the conflict of interest is wonderful. We need more companies to be building these things and centralizing them in their own best interests. But in doing so, what you create is a diversity of options. Like today, right now, if you wanted to build some machine learning thing, there's really only two purveyors. Is that a good thing over time, knowing how powerful that stuff is? Probably not. Should there be 10? Probably. How do you get from 2 to 10? You only get from 2 to 10 if you realize that all of that software runs on specialized hardware. And so what does a guy like me do? I go and build it, and then I decide how to stage gate the exposure of it. On the hope, and it may be just a hope, that 2 can go to 10. Because 10 is better than 2. But there, there's some policy out there. Thank you. And here's why I I'm kind of confused about what you mean by centralization. If, especially as a venture capitalist who invests in companies, right? I mean, I'm not as you are. Right? So, if companies have to essentially develop products based on various set of rules and regulations, do you think that might actually impede them from developing their product? The fact that to go to the market, they have to essentially take into consideration all of these rules. I mean, that's how basically the rest of the world is. But that's not how that's, but that's not how product development works. Sure it is. And no, I'm ask for You get to a certain point, then you have to No, start. I mean, these points fly. They don't go down every day. Well, okay, that's a very, very... You're talking about how do you regulate it? Yeah. But that, that's my point. Like, what we're debating, well, this, is, this is what I'm saying is the fallacy. You're not debating whether rules are good or bad. You're debating the downstream efficiency and profitability of the incumbent business that operates in that market. And well, what I'm saying is, yeah, you're right. It would be wonderful if every business had 90% gross margins and 70% EBITDA margins and traded at 30 times 4. It'd be amazing. We'd all be super rich. But you know what? Maybe the right thing to do that isn't what should happen. 
do you think using an airline where at least uh, a uh, highly regulated with pretty much two. And why is it highly world? regulated? You're not, you're not answering. No, 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 why is it highly regulated? It is highly regulated because it's about human safety. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you could argue that. Okay. Right? Okay. 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 But in the end, you know, someone just claiming some fallacy on the internet is not necessarily causing 500 deaths by. How about, how about I can read an article? Oh, there might be. <laughs> <laughs> was unbelievably remorseful that showed up at some pizza parlor in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., trying to shoot the place up based on an article that he saw. What if people had been killed? Yeah. I so, can tell you stories like that. So that there's, some, there's actually a point I wanted to make earlier about the question, um, uh, because I, I'm, I'm sorry to, uh, to drop, but uh, while I'm, um, if I'm asked as a technologist, I'll answer the same Jamal answer about like should the companies be held accountable. Uh, but because I look the other side and I empathize with people who get targeted online, um, I actually had like a rumor against me that was kind of life threatening uh, that took place in 2011 about a statement I made against the Egyptian army. And the Egyptian army is a taboo in Egypt. And you talk about the Egyptian army, you're fucked. Sorry to say the word. Um, so. Um, it was like a random page that all what it does is spreading story, you know, statements from people who never said them. So I sent a mail to, uh, to Facebook uh, uh, contacts and I told them, uh, please, can you remove this because it's hurting me. They said um, it doesn't fit into our policies to deal with this. I said it's totally, I did not say it. They said we have no way to know if you said it or not. And um, that statement lived and it got viral. And in, in, in my world as an activist, um, first, the, the algorithm is the one that distributed that. It, it's kind of like the editor of the New York Times. If the editor of the New York Times takes, takes a fake story about me and publish it on the internet and get millions of people to read it, I want to hold that guy accountable or, or that lady accountable. I want to I wanna, I wanna go after them legally and because they, they are hurting my personal interests. They're putting me at risk. And I like to think the same uh, applies to, to companies. And... Uh, um, you know, you talked about like uh, Boeing's killing. There, there's actually a, 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 an Egyptian uh, a Shia minority scholar that was killed um, by a mob because of a Facebook post. Um, so, so actually, and I tell that to the ranking engineers: whatever you are building here is not algorithms and, 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 and mathematics. You are you are you are changing people's lives for the better or for the worse, whether you mean it or not. And the, the unintended consequences consequences are and are enormous. So, you know, I, I want a world where actually, yes, if Facebook produce, uh, 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 promotes a certain story above a certain threshold using the algorithm that's engagement driven, um, there is some form of a mechanism where I, uh, uh, I could go after them legally and say, no, 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 you're not just a platform because the algorithm made the decision. It's, it's not, in the, in the early days of the internet, I would go to YouTube to upload the video because there are no other ways to upload a video technologically and have it available online. That's when YouTube was a service provider. But YouTube is not a service provider. YouTube is a media company. YouTube algorithm make decisions, uh, billions of decisions every day for what content should be served to whom, and that, that is a job of an editor. It's true that the editor here is an algorithm, but it doesn't matter. The impact is the same on users. So I think, I don't know how, how could we do it. I don't know how could we hold them accountable because I also see the downside of holding them accountable to, to such spread. But I would say if they can't figure it out and they have billions of dollars, well, they shouldn't be providing the service if it's harmful for the society. I mean, of course, that's, that's a ridiculous statement, but, but the idea is like, if you can't serve a community, if you can't respond, uh, it's kind of, in the crypto, uh, Perform nowadays, like all these exchanges who open them, you know, uh, they can't serve the customers. They respond after many, many, many days of, uh, uh, of custom, customers panic. And, you know, the, the basic thing here is like, if you can't serve those customers, why are you providing a service to them? You're going to get out of business. But in Facebook, it's kind of different. You're not going to get out of business by simply not removing a certain story because it's already like 2 billion people are on the platform. There's network effect that you cannot really be. I don't know how, how much would you agree uh, uh, would you agree with this? Well, there's a lot of news. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to actually say this has been an incredibly rich conversation. I think these last set of comments, for me at least, 
point to the need for governance innovations that match this digital ecosystem. So even the concept of centralization, it's not going to look the same. We are not going back simply to traditional yep. nation states and fragmented jurisdictions making rules. Um, there, there's, a, there's some effort to do that, but that's not what's going to work. Um, and I think that there are innovations and as it relates to truth and algorithms and accountability of platforms, just going to throw out one thing that didn't come up. If you look at the model of Wikipedia and they, they somehow have this secret sauce, which it's, it's distributed, it's uh, user generated input, but it's rule based. Mm -hmm. So somehow they have created this innovative governance approach to truthful quality content. Can I say, can I say one very last yeah. thing? You're gonna see, I think, a version of what the model will look like in autonomous cars. I think it's gonna go along the following lines. Um, everybody that, mm -hmm. you know, Ford, Tesla, General Motors, Mercedes, BMW, they're all gonna to wanna to build autonomous cars. And we're all gonna to wanna to know that it's, that it's not going to, you know, well, oh my God, there's a school bus and uh, an old person, mm -hmm. what do you run into? You know, that, that classic canonical depth, you know. Well, or it's like standards and protocols too. We, we need a yeah. protocol. So I think what's gonna happen is, I think what will happen is governments will say, we are gonna control access to the training data. You guys can build whatever mm -hmm. you wanna do. But we're gonna control the training data. And whatever you do has to come to the following outcomes. And if it does, we're gonna certify that you're allowed to exist. Mm -hmm. And that I think is going to be the model. So again, why it's so important to get access to training data, and which is again, why it's so critical to really think through the implications of GDPR in Europe and how it spills over to the rest of the world. But to me, that is probably the most tractable, scalable solution. Modern governance will say, governments will say, I own the data. I'm gonna give it to you guys to train your algorithms. It has to follow these rules. And if I find out that these rules aren't being met, hey Ford, you actually turn left instead of turn right, there's going to be a cost. And those penalties will escalate, et cetera, et cetera. And again, we live with that today. You know, you can't go through a recall without having enormous economic implications to you. What is that version of a recall for software? We don't know, but we're going to figure it out. And we're going to be forced to. <laughs> okay, well, thank you both. And <laughs>